trying to take a person's place, so I hope you'll get it all out of your mind real quick. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure the problem will be will be within you. Now, before I get to, uh, get started recording and all this stuff, I want to uh, say a couple of things. I brought a few books a few months ago, uh, back in uh, about. Uh, well, I guess it was July. Uh, I had just gotten up and learned that I was going to be able to travel on the type of dialysis that I'm on and function. And I was in South Carolina, and <clears throat> God began to deal with me so mightily about revival. About revival, I have never forsaken my original Desire, vision and desire and burden for revival. Uh, although I had integrated that particular message into a, a number of things, but um, your works will always follow your faith, and your faith will always follow your burden and vision, and uh, your burden and vision will always follow your revelation. I mean, you, you can get it out of order, I mean, but it will come if you stay in line. And <clears throat> so somehow, uh, some way, I had slipped away from the real burden and vision that I had initially had years and years and years ago. And uh, in Carolina there, I just, I a little country church, I began to find myself really under a burden for revival in that little local church. And uh, I'll tell you, God got in that place, and we started seeing the glory of God in a couple of nights. Uh, later, I, I couldn't even stand in the pulpit because I was so weak. And so I went home and checked my blood pressure, and I didn't have any to mount anything. and. One of the problems I have had for years since I was sick in 1971 is blood pressure. And I didn't have any blood pressure except, you know, relatively something like a, about 90 over 60, 50, something like that. It wasn't real. So I called my doctor and she's in London. <clears throat> nice place to be. And so then I called my family doctor, I, what I call my family doctor. And he said, Lord, I don't know what what to do right he said you know about as bad as I do and he said no. so I called my druggist and between that doctor and the druggist and myself we started taking me off of that medication before the week was off I was completely off of blood pressure medication now when I had damaged kidneys because of the sickness in 71 we understood that my blood pressure was caused somewhat by the damaged kidneys but we also was aware that um, we were aware that uh, my blood pressure was caused from uh, a hypertension type problem, which a lot of people have. And uh, when I went on the dialysis, we felt the uh, kidney problem affected blood pressure would be solved, but the hypertension problem that caused the blood pressure would not be solved. But here it was being solved. And uh, so I began to ask the Lord, you know, what it was. My doctor, she couldn't explain it to me. And the Lord showed me, said, well, said, you've been in such conflict with me over this thing of revival. Uh, he said, that, that's just naturally causing a conflict in your body. And so since then, I hadn't had to basically have any kind of blood pressure medication whatsoever. And it's been fascinating to the doctor more than it has me, I think. But uh, the peace that I have... And God just really renewed my vision and my burden and also my faith to believe, beloved, that uh, uh, that we're going to have revival. 
Now, I, I realize in many days, many years, I, I was looking for the harvest without paying the price of the law of harvest, breaking up the fallow ground, planting the seed, watering the seed, cultivating the seed, and then one day reap the harvest. And I may never see the fulfillment of the harvest, but I am committed to breaking up the ground, planting the seed, watering the seed, and, and laying the foundation where it, it's on the way. And folk, I know it's on the way. I am a strong believer that uh, the only way the Lord will prepare the church for his coming is by a mighty revival. I believe scripture teaches that. I, I believe you can prove it. And I, I believe without any shadow of a doubt that, that that's the only way the church will be presented to Jesus without spot or wrinkle. I don't think persecution will do it. I think it's think of the mighty Holy Spirit revival. And if I didn't believe that, I still believe that any time anyone will pay the price individually, they can have revival on a personal basis. So uh, we're still in good grounds. And uh, because of that, uh, I have a... Uh, I prayed, and the Lord showed me. He said, now what you need to do is uh, you and Jimmy need to get together. So I was in this area, and the Lord told me that. And I couldn't tell Jimmy, but the Lord told him and uh, worked out some things. And um, you have possibly received revival fires this past week. But uh, if you got it, 62,000, 60-something thousand other people got it. And uh, we're excited. We'll probably put it to half a million people. And I know Ivan might faint back there, but uh, I, you know, tell him what it might do. And uh, God's up to things, folk. I mean, he's up to things. If I've ever believed in the sovereignty of God, I do today. Some kiddo came by last night and said, Brother Manley, are you a five-point Calvinist? I said, I didn't know Calvin was five points. <clears throat> I said, a man had to be dumb to think Calvin had five points. And uh, I knew what he was trying to talk about, so I tried to avoid the issue. But, um, but, so I, but I tell you, I do believe in the sovereignty of God. And I believe God is sovereignly at work right now and doing the work. I'm just glad he's going to let me be in on a little bit of it <laughs> on the last go round. Now I brought uh, and I brought a few books down here because we are we are committed uh, to getting books those books that were out in the 40s and 50s and not out anymore we're committed to reprinting those books and getting them out and so I just brought uh, just th uh, three books and we just wanted to see I didn't bring many but I'll tell you what if you have never read the story of Samuel Marsh this copy. You have missed half of your Christian life. I'm not kidding you. How many of you have ever read it? Raise your hand. <laughs> and you, they're not, you can't possibly be as saved as you ought to be to you read this book. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. You've never read this, Billy Bridges? Lord God, son, you'll tell East Texas you read that book. <laughs> I have never seen, I have never read the little story of a person in my life that's blessed me about this little old black boy. I mean, friend, it will blow your mind. And uh, I'm up here trying to sell these books. I don't have ten copies back there. I don't know why I'm trying to sell it. And uh, this uh, this is a book on revival. It's sound. I've read it. It is. Uh, I don't know that this man ever experienced what he's written about, but he has the best library on revival in America. And the book is well worth its price uh, just for the bibliography back here in the back pages to where you can go and find other books on revival. But it, it is good. It, it'll help you. And then it's touching the invisible. I do not recommend Norman Grubb be on his book on the law of faith. From there on, you might come up and think he talks about a one nature. And he does a little bit. But it's strange. His last book, he says there's still a conflict. So I don't know why he ever decided to write on one nature anyway. <laughs> but uh, this little booklet on touching the invisible will give you the basic principles by which a person has to learn how to trust God. It's just a few of these copies. And then uh, I bought some of these because this is something that really means a lot to me called My Utmost for His Highest. 
it's in the leather bound, and so you might be interested in that. My daughter was given by Dr. James X. A. Stewart, Bruce Stewart, I think 15 years ago, a little devotional book uh, that had a leather back on it. And you know she's still using it today. Now, a lot of you have got the regular copy of this, uh, but you won't wear this one out. Now, that's all I wanted to say. I'm sorry I took that time. And it probably won't uh, say any more because it probably, you'll probably get all that stuff for, uh, at this one time. Now, I'm, I'm not a Bible teacher. I've never claimed to be a Bible teacher. I'm a preacher, but I'm not a teacher. Most of all, I want to be a man of God and known as a man of God. I tell you, I, I'm not even going to be known as a man with this ministry or that ministry. It's good to be known as a man of God. Now, I want to say some, give you some verses that I possibly will uh, make reference to in these morning services if I continue the route I think I will. And that is this. The Bible says, The just shall live by faith. And the Bible says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And the Bible says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. I you know those are some strong, strong statements from the Lord. The disciples came to Jesus one night. Now this is a fascinating truth. The disciples came to Jesus one day or one night and said, Lord, what is it that we might do that we might work the works of God? Now, I'll tell you what Jesus said to them blew my mind and challenged my life. You know what Jesus said to them? He said, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. Isn't that interesting? Amen. You know, I, I wondered for years why Jesus would make that statement. I don't see why he didn't say, well, what you need to do if you're saved is join the church, Baptist church, that. And what you need to do is read your Bible. And what you need to do is pray. And what you need to do is witness and tithe. I don't see why Jesus didn't tell him that. But he didn't tell him that. He said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. So obviously Jesus knew something about the faith relationship with God that a believer is to have that, that's not on the surface there. And of course, if you ever read the book of Galatians and the book of Romans and the book of James, you find out, my dear friends, right soon that the Christian life is not a life of faith and works, but it's a life of faith that works. And, a lot of and so this morning, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to start with, 11, uh, with the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I realize that, um, that men made these divisions in these chapters, and I don't always agree or disagree with them. But I'm going to start with what I think is a constant thought here and develop this out of the 11th chapter, 10th and 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to start with the 35th verse. It says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and I will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall no find no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. See, we're not. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And I think you'll find that word soul there indicates more than being born again. I think if you, you'll check your Bible carefully in the original there. Now, the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that is not a definition of faith. That is a statement of faith. That is not a definition. Now, you might get somewhat of a definition out of it, but it's a statement. And for by it, and talk about faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now, I want you to jump with me to 
the 12th verse of that 11th chapter. Therefore sprang there even a one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as a sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all, these all, what all? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, that means absolutely experienced the total fulfillment of the promises. But now watch this outline in the King James. But having seen them afar off, what did they see? The promises. And were persuaded of them, what? The promises. And embraced them, what? The promises. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, this passage, this message of Hebrews, I understand, is written to some Christians that obviously is in a great deal of difficulty. I don't think you have to read this book long to realize that they are in some kind of affliction. And he is telling them not to cast their confidence away. He is saying that you have need of patience. That if you stand true, the Lord is going to come on through. For the just, then he says, the just to this crowd under affliction. He said, the just shall live by faith. He said, really, you are not of that crowd that draws back unto perdition. You are of that crowd that believes to the saving of your soul. Meaning, I believe, having victory in your life and overcoming under all circumstances. And then he says, that statement of faith that we're so familiar with now, faith, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He said, but they obtained a good report. The elders obtained a good report. And then we jump all the way over to that 12th verse where it says, And a promise, I am going to bless your seed above the stars that will outnumber the stars of the sky and outnumber the sands of the seashore. Now, who is he talking to? Most of us think that basically he's talking to Abraham. Well, he's talking to Abraham, then who is he talking about? Is he talking about Abraham? Abraham, you're as good as dead, and I'm going to bless your seed. You're outnumber the stars of the sky and outnumber the sands of the seashore. Well, sometimes you wonder because uh, Ishmael was the seed of Abraham as well as Isaac. Amen. Now, God did tell Abraham, Isaac is thy only son. And so that gives you some thought, though. You need to think about it. Some theologians say that seed is really talking about, uh, in a literal sense, is talking about Isaac. Out of Isaac's seed. You see, whoever it was, whoever seed it was, it says they all died in faith. Ishmael certainly didn't die in faith. Now, he said they all died in faith. Now, really, if you take this verse in the context of the whole Bible, it says that Abraham is the father of us all that are what? Believers. Now, you know Abraham wasn't a Jew. He wasn't. wasn't. Something went off. Something went out. You need to pray. I knew that. I heard that. I heard that. I could have told you that when Brother Punch Call got through. Do you have batteries in this wireless? Just hold on. I can pick up where I stopped. I just don't want to mess up the recording. Uh, do you have batteries in this wireless? 
Somebody answer me. I mean, when Brother Gordon was preaching, well, it sounded like you sound like uh, it was the battery is going bad in it, but this is one of those new ones, so I thought maybe you didn't do that stuff. All this technician technical stuff here, we're going to hear me out with another one. I'm sure. <clears throat> Paul said, uh, "You know, you're you're not you're not really a Jew, but you really are. What are you talking about? The seed that Abraham is talking about is the seed that discovered the only way." God, in his economy, has learned that man relates to God. That is only one way man relates to God. I don't know what Baptist, why we can't get this straight. Romans 4.16 says it. It says it has to be of great, it has to be of faith that it might be of grace. In other words, the only way for a person to receive the grace of God is by faith. And the seed that God promises Abraham to bless as beyond the stars of the sky and the sea of the seashore, or sands of the seashore, is the seed that discovers the truth and lives by the truth that it is a faith that it might be of grace. And a person that does not discover that truth is not a child of God. And if they have discovered it, in the new birth, and they do not know how to live by faith, they are a displeasure to God, they are not righteous before God, and my dear friends, their religion is a religion of works, not a religion of Christianity. And he plainly says it here, I'm going to bless your seed beyond the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. What seed? These all died in faith. Now listen, I'm going to define it. The seed, they all died in faith, not having received the fulfillment of the promises. But now watch it, it defines faith. Here's your definition of faith. They saw the promises of God. Faith always originates from discovering the truth. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The truth. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them. The faith was born out of the fact that they discovered the truth. They discovered the truth. They all discovered the truth about God and about themselves in relationship to God in every given situation. They not only discovered the truth, but they became persuaded of the truth, that this is the truth indeed. They not only became persuaded of that truth, but they embraced, they acted on, they believed, they Really, they responded to that truth not with their spirit, not with their soul, but with their whole being. For when you make a decision in your will, your inner being, your whole body responds to that truth, and your whole body becomes a confession of what you believe. Your whole body becomes a work according to your faith. So, I'm going to bless you with a seed that outnumbered the stars of the sky 
and the sands of the seashore. That seed will be a people, my dear friends, who have learned to discover the truth, be persuaded of the truth, embrace the truth, and confess it. And upon that basis, I have always worked, and he said I will work and will always work, and no other basis. If you don't believe that, look in your 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and see. He said, by faith, now remember that, by faith, now what are we talking about? They saw the truth, they were persuaded of the truth, they embraced the truth, they confessed the truth, that's what we're talking about, by faith. So by faith, what? Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Amen. He's going to give us a whole history of the Bible right here in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Amen. And what was the economy from the beginning of the Bible right up to the day? By faith, through faith. Amen. It says, by faith. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Can you imagine a man running around believing he's not going to die when everybody's dying about him? Amen. Now, if you brought that back in the context of our day, you'd bring it in the context of hope, not faith. But it wasn't hope, but the Bible says it's faith. That means he saw the truth, he was persuaded of the truth, he embraced the truth, and he confessed the truth when everybody's died. I'm not going to die. You see, Abel worshiped God, Enoch walked with God. It's by faith, my dear friends. It's by faith that it happened. Listen. By faith, Noah was warned of God of things not seen as yet. Noah with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I mean, my dear friend, this man saw the truth. He was persuaded of the truth. He embraced the truth and he confessed the truth. And he confessed it by going out there building an ark when it hadn't even been on the rain. Oh, what a stupid man you are. Sure, he's stupid to the world. But my dear friends, he was confessing something he had embraced. Amen. And he'd embraced something he was persuaded of. And he had persuaded of something he had seen nobody else had seen. And that was the truth of the situation. Amen. The will of God about his life. Amen. I mean, folks, all we're doing is going through the Bible, but I'm trying to show you that it's a work of faith. I preached so much on faith back in past years and everybody thought I was stupid and they wouldn't listen to me. When I got a hold of this, I said, My Lord God, I don't see why you didn't kill me for even doubting you. <laughs> Amen. Brother Noah walked by faith. Brother Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive a foreign inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whether he went. How did it happen? He wasn't a leap into the dark. He was a leap into the light. He saw the promises. He was persuaded of them. He embraced them. And he confessed them by his obedience. And he shook in the middle of it. But I'll tell you one thing. He still came through on top. Yes, sir. It was my faith. I mean... This man, this man walks this bunch of people completely through Bible history and shows them, be patient. Stand and believe that just shall live by faith. Look, it's always been by faith and it's going to be by faith. So you stay in there by faith. Yes, sir, Abraham walked by faith. He didn't only walk by faith, but... It goes right on down. He was tested by faith. It says in the 17th verse, By faith him he was tried 
offered up Isaac, that he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. It's by faith. My dear friends, he, when he hit that crisis, he saw the truth. He was persuaded of the truth. He embraced it by his obedience, confessed it by what he did. It's by faith, my dear friends, he went through that trial. Not only Brother Abraham, but Brother Isaac, our sister Sarah, let's don't leave her out. Amen? She counted God faithful. I mean, she didn't even, I mean, she didn't go in on Abraham's faith. If you'll study her life carefully, she had to get to the place that she had faith herself. Amen. What does that mean? That means she saw the truth. She was persuaded of the truth. She embraced the truth and confessed the truth. That's faith. Isaac. Bless Jacob. Isn't that amazing? Old man blessing his sons. And he saw concerning the things to come. How did he do it? He saw something. He was persuaded of it. And he embraced it. And he confessed it. He said, son, this is going to happen. Amen. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, said, boys, when you leave this place, take my bones out of here. He wasn't hoping. He had seen something. He'd become persuaded of it. And he's embracing it. And he was confessing it. It may have taken God 400 years to get to it, but he got to it. Amen. Amen. Not only Brother Jacob, but Brother Moses, Brother Joseph. When he might have died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. And concerning his bones, he also said, take mine with you. Amen. Don't leave me down here in this land. Because one of these days, you're going to march out of this place. You're going to leave this place. How he didn't do it. He saw the promises. He was persuaded of the promises. He embraced the promises and confessed them. <coughs> he didn't experience the fulfillment of it. But I don't think he mind. Right. Because when you get to the place of faith, that's the victory whether you experience the fulfillment of it or not. Amen. Yes, sir. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid by his parents. And obviously it was his parents' faith. They saw it was a proper child. They so shut the devil up on this boy that the devil's daughter walked down by the river and loved that little old Jew when she saw it. (laughs) He made the devil pay the diaper bill, the laundry bill, the educational bill, and even made the devil hire that baby's own mama to be the babysitter. Now, ladies, you can't do that by works. It has to be done by faith. Amen. By faith, beloved, when he came to the right place at the right time, prepared, he forsook the wealth and the pomp and the power of Egypt to suffer the afflictions of the Christian, the people of God. And it was because he saw the truth. He was persuaded of it. And he embraced it and he confessed it. I mean, I mean, he's taken a flight all the way through the book. And my dear friends, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. By faith he kept the Passover. Isn't that something? By faith they passed through the Red Sea. Amen. Amen. My dear friends, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. What do we mean by faith? It means, friend, they discovered the mind of God. They were persuaded of it. They embraced it and they acted on it. Before it was so. In order for it to be so. 
because with God it was so. He, he's not through yet telling that about something. He said, Rahab the harlot got saved by faith. Got her whole family saved by faith. Kept her whole family saved in the city of Jericho while God destroyed the rest of it by faith. She saw the promises, persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed them, and hung a little old thread out, and everything went but that. That was covered by the Lord. Ah, by faith, my dear friend. What shall I say more, or must say, more say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, David, Samson, Samuel, prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of sword, out of weakness were made strong, worked violent in fight, turned fights the armies to fight the armies of the allies. Women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured. Well, they were tortured by faith. Why, Brother Manley, I thought the faith would keep you from being tortured. Who told you that? One of these television preachers trying to raise ten million dollars? How one of these preachers that's preaching on faith that doesn't know faith from feeling? By faith they were tortured. What do you mean? They saw it, they were persuaded of it, and embraced it, and walked into it, acting like a saint of God. And in the midst of that torture, gave such testimony of the glory of God that I guarantee you the world still shaking. Over people like that. They weren't only tortured. It says, uh, not accepting deliverances, that they might obtain a better resurrection. My goodness, how'd they do that? By faith. And others had trials of cruel, cruel mockings and scourging, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were strong, they were strong asunder, were tempted, tempted and were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goat skin and being destitute, afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. How did they do that? They were even sawn sawed apart. How did they do it? They did it by faith. By faith. What do we mean? As they faced life in its given situations, in redemption and sanctification and service, and that's the only three areas you have any responsibility in. They faced this responsibility by discovering the truth, by being persuaded of it, by embracing it, by giving their life, and confessing it with their life. And by this, my friends, they were able to go through. And God said for this crowd, for this crowd, he said, because of this crowd, he said, we're not worthy. Yes, sir. Oh, we're not worthy. For they all obtained a good report through faith. Yes, sir. God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, folk, we can even get in on a more complete fulfillment of that reality than some of those. But it was by faith. No wonder the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please Him. No wonder the Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. No wonder the just shall live by faith That's the only way there's ever been to live and relate to God. That 
that's the only way to live and relate to God this morning. And it will always be the only way to live and relate to God. And you have to let your intellect come along and try to explain what's going on. And you have to let your emotions play the tricks they will play. And if they happen to co- co- cooperate with what God is doing good and if they don't, good. Yeah, right. People came up to me this morning and said, Brother Manley, I'm glad you're feeling better. I didn't know I was feeling bad. <laughs> I'm honest, I'm not playing games with you. How I feel has nothing to do with who I am and what I'm doing. Amen. You say, well, don't you give in? Yeah. When he gives in. Yeah. Some people by faith have been taken out of all kinds of afflictions. But some by faith have gone right through them. That's right. But it's still been by faith. Amen. You can tell whether or not you're in faith this morning or not. You say, I can? Yes. By looking at the fact for those things that which you're hoping for and wanting if you have full assurance, they're yours. By the fact God is manifesting it in your life, or you have such assurance in your hand that you can stand up and praise God. He's doing it right now, even though you can't see it. And if you're on any less grounds than that, my dear friends, you either do not know what the Bible teaches about faith, or you are not in the position of faith. I went to a church that's nearest to revival as I've seen in a long time over in Georgia a few weeks ago. And I tell you, I, I've seen the brokenness and I've seen the openness and I mean the restitution and saw all that and people getting saved. And they said, Brother Manley, is this that? I said, it's some of it, but it's not all of it. They said, Why? I said, you don't have the faith. Well, as soon as God sends it, we can believe it. Sure. The devil didn't believe it then. But when you come to that place where you seem the truth, and you persuade it of it, and you embrace it, and confess it, that assurance, to where you confess it, that it's happening, folk. And this is not making believe. This confession comes out of an obedient act. This obedient act comes out of a blessed assurance. And that blessed assurance comes out of the fact that God has spoken about that given situation. There's only one way to walk with him. It has to be a faith that it might be a grace. Brother Jimmy.